By the end of this session, you'll be able to know what we mean by conflict, balance, peace in academic studies. By the end of this course, you will get familiar with some of the major theories used in peace and conflict studies. This is some of the scenes that you may be familiar in Southeast Asia. What this picture shows is this a conflict? Well, this is probably um, very obvious. Um, everybody know conflict is ongoing in Myanmar. Next one, two brothers are fighting over a piece of cake. Okay, this is a much interpersonal level, but we can still define it as a conflict. Question is, is there any common thing between conflict interpersonal level and conflict at the national level? For instance, conflict in Thailand, conflict in Myanmar, conflict in the Philippines, conflict between these two brothers. Are there anything common? In conflict studies, we all agree there are something common in all conflict, whether it is big or small, whether it is a national level or interpersonal level. And the important thing is, without proper understanding of conflict, it is impossible to come up with appropriate policy making. And at the same time, even though we know the causes of conflict, we sometimes cannot resolve it. Why is it so? Why it is always difficult to resolve a conflict, particularly those ones that are prolonged, protracted ones? To know it, we need to properly define conflict. And this is a famous definition of conflict uh, suggested by Christopher Mitchell. Conflict is any situation in which two or more parties perceive that they have mutually incompatible goals. This is a very important, very foundation of, of peace and conflict studies, particularly conflict resolution. Because I highlighted that two or more parties perceive that they have mutually incompatible goals. Okay, so perceptions are important and parties' goals are important. So, if you really want to understand the conflict, you need to understand what goals the parties have and what perceptions they have. The conflict can be at multiple levels. It can be interpersonal level, intergroup level, intercommunity, international level, but also it can be intrapersonal level. Okay. One example of intrapersonal conflict, for instance, I would like to watch football, but I have assignment to submit by tomorrow morning. So I have to do assignment, but I want to watch football. So now I have a conflict within myself, within myself, okay? But in conflict resolution, okay, this interpersonal conflict is not a target because it's about relational, interpersonal level. So the earlier definitions show two or more parties perceive that they have mutually incompatible goal. But the intrapersonal level conflict is also important uh, some of you involved in uh, psychology in, in, to achieve peace. Why? Because sometimes your psychological problem causes intra-conflict, inter-level conflict. Also, your spiritual um, peacefulness is important. So sometimes your religious teaching, religious development is important to achieve inner peace. By using the earlier definition of conflict, we can study conflict from three levels. According to Johann Galton, all conflict have those three factors. And uh, in order to resolve the conflict, those three factors must be worked. First one, behavior 
of course, conflict parties have certain conflict behavior. It may be violent one, it may be not violent one. And as I said, contradiction is linked with the goals of party. Two parties try to achieve certain goal, but it is incompatible. That is why it becomes conflict. Third one, the attitude. Attitude is how the parties of conflict perceive others. So if I use earlier example, two brothers are fighting over a piece of cake. Their behavior is easier, we can see. They are hitting, kicking with each other, okay? Their goal is to get a piece of cake. So the cake is only one. They cannot achieve, both goals cannot be achieved at the same time. That's what we call incompatible goal. An elder brother think that he should get it because he's older. Younger brother think that he should get it because he's smaller and should grow. So these thinking is a perception of the party. So in order to resolve this conflict, of course, you have to think about what to do with this cake because the goals of the parties are to get the cake. So you may bring new cake, you may divide a cake. So you have to resolve this incompatibility. But at the same time, you have to work on this perception. Why elder brother think that he should get it just because he is older? So in order to resolve conflict, you, you must work on all three levels, behavior, attitude, and context. So we need to study those three factors if you would like to resolve conflict. We can visibly see conflict parties' behavior, but we may not see conflict parties' attitude and also goals. So if you really want to resolve conflict, it's not only to handle violent or nonviolent behavior, but also you, we, we need to resolve, we need to study what conflict parties attitude, what conflict parties contradictions, goals. So you, according to Johan Galton, whether it is interpersonal level or national level of conflict, there are those three factors in all conflict. So we need to study on these if we would like to resolve them. That's the very idea of conflict analysis. These three factors are said very important to understand the conflict and the conflict parties. But as you see, attitude is linked with the conflict parties' perception, belief, feeling. So that's a subjective aspect. And conflict parties' objectives usually linked with materials or something valuable for the person, which is objective aspect. So all conflict usually have subjective and objective aspect. And this is obvious partly because human, uh, social science deal with human beings and human beings have emotion, feeling, belief. That's a subjective aspect. But we also, usually have conflict with certain objective goals to achieve. So we need to study both objective and subjective aspect of conflict. Did you get the difference between subjective and objective aspect? Um, if we consider the root causes, um, we need to look at first objective aspect because Objective aspect is usually linked with the goals of the party. When you have conflict with your mother, for instance, you would like to study abroad. Your mother is against it, okay? Your objective is to going abroad to study. Your mother is to keep you in, in your own country. 
Okay, so objectives, both parties' objectives are there, but they are incompatible. Okay, so to understand the objective of the party, you need to study what are the interests of the parties, what the underlying need of the party, and listen to the claims by parties. Now, more complex issue is subjective aspect because it's linked with a perception. You know your perception, but you don't know your enemy's perception. Unless you ask your enemy, you cannot understand what perception your enemy have. And this perception is very deep because the person's belief values are not formed today, but from historically long experience. So, perception studying perception someone's perception is not easy but if you would like to resolve conflict you need to study perception of the party both sides and this is a tricky part because when you ask what's wrong with you sometimes people do not frankly explain to you unless he or she trusts you right so understanding perception is more difficult, take time, because it closely linked with the person's experience and historical issues, etc. But without understanding both objective and subjective aspect, it's extremely difficult to resolve conflict because both are linked with the root causes of conflict. There are different types of conflict. And uh, if there's no contradiction, no conflict behavior, there's no conflict. But even though we don't see direct violence or conflicting behavior, sometimes there is a conflict. For instance, in your office, some of your colleagues have conflict, but every day seen, they don't show it. They are friendly, nicely talk with each other, but maybe they hate each other in themselves, right? So that type of conflict is latent conflict. It may develop into open conflict. So it's ideal to resolve conflict when it is still invisible, before it gets violent. And open conflict is, of course, you can see the visible violent scenes as well as contradictions of the parties. So this is an open conflict, full conflict. Surface conflict happens usually because of a misunderstanding. Um, for instance, my neighbor uh, tried to interfere into the, the house. And I sometimes thought, okay, my neighbor tried to get this land, piece of land. But neighbors are not really interested in the piece of land. They just try to clean it every day. So misunderstanding sometimes causes conflict behavior, but there's no contradiction between the party. That's a surface conflict. So we see different type of conflict in everyday sin. It's not always visible. And the terms that you may need to remember for future sessions is symmetric and symmetric conflict. Symmetric conflict is that parties are relatively equal in power and status, whereas a symmetric conflict is power and the status of conflict parties are not equal. For instance, majority and minority. And a conflict within a country, sometimes between government and armed groups. These are asymmetric conflict because their power and available arms, economic powers are different. And in many cases at the national level, we see asymmetric conflict. Power is in equal. Symmetric conflicts, conflict between you and your colleague, for instance, you and your students conflict, that's asymmetric because you have power to give grade or not, right? So we see everyday sin, asymmetric conflict very regularly. And at the national level conflict or international level conflict, um, we see more asymmetric conflict than symmetric one. For instance, conflict between Ukraine and uh, Russia. What do you think? Is it 
symmetric or asymmetric. Both are independent states. What do you think? If we look at the economic level available arms, we have to compare those one by one, and then we may realize it, it is supposed to be symmetric conflict, but um, if we carefully check those different item economic military capacity, it must be asymmetric. Who decide the power? Who assess the power is important. According to your assessment, perhaps Russia is more powerful because of its economy, size of the territory, and the military capacity. But if we look at from UN perspective, both as independent sovereign state, which has equal rights, right? So it depends on who decides powerful and not powerful. Usually most companies have both aspects, subjective and objective aspects. But of course it depends on which is more influential to cause mm -hmm. violence behavior because conflict involve human beings right all conflicts involve human beings and we have emotions and values and belief this is a subjective aspect so that is why all conflict have subjective aspects That's possible. For instance, if you meet someone for the first time, you don't know the person at all. So you have no precondition, pre feeling towards the, your enemy. The person suddenly come into your house. Of course, you're physically affected by the person, right? So you don't have any subjective feeling the person in the beginning because it's a stranger, right? But the person intervene in your house. As I highlighted this arrow with red, these are closely linked. In the very beginning, there is some contradiction between the two parties, but it can immediately influence over your feeling. So when someone come into your house, in the very beginning, you have no feeling towards a person, but immediately as you see the person in your house, you feel insecure, right? When you start feeling some kind of antagonistic feeling towards the other, that's the moment the subjective aspect coming in. So these objective and subjective aspects are very, very closely linked and can immediately influence over each other. That is why it's difficult to resolve conflict because you cannot track every objective and subjective aspect as it develops. Both parties have different feeling, different you know, way of thinking. So you have to study both carefully if you really resolve. But this is not always possible, especially when it comes to the national level of conflict. What we can see in conflict behavior, sometimes it's violent one, sometimes not violent one. For instance, violent one is hitting, kicking, using arms, etc. But not only that, conflict party in the very beginning start ignoring each other. That's also behavior, right? And also stop communication. This is also behavior. So Conflict behavior is not only violent one, but also it includes nonviolent one. Stop communication, ignoring each other, keeping distance with that person. These are also conflicting behavior. We also see different types of violence in everyday scenes. Direct violence is, as I said, hitting and kicking. But apart from direct violence, we see structural and cultural violence. 
to Hungarian define structural and cultural violence. Structural violence refers to any constraints on human potential due to economic political structure, unequal access to resources, to political power, education, healthcare, or to legal standing. These are forms of structural violence, and it's almost always invisible, embedded in social structures. Perhaps you recognize those who, who are aware of human rights recognize this is closely linked with human rights violations. Cultural violence is understood as those aspects of culture that can be used to justify or legitimate the use of direct or structural violence. For instance, I, if I hit you by saying that you are from different country, so I hit you, this is direct violence. You see direct violence. But if I say I justify myself, I use the physical violence because he or she is from other country. So I justify my direct violence by using cultural difference. So religious difference, um, ethnic differences, these can be used to justify direct violence or structural violence. For instance, if your country make a constitution that say only certain group can stand for election, okay? This is cultural violence and also structural violence. Why? Because ethnic differences are used to justify for the government to allow standing for election or not. And they make a constitution. So they structurally embedded an equal opportunity to different ethnic groups. So cultural violence and structural violence are used in, in this political process. Structural and cultural violence are quite often seen in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, legal standing, political standing, or political process itself, using cultural difference to justify certain policy, certain law by the government. So structural violence, cultural violence are closely linked to with human rights studies because these are addressed from human rights perspective and also development perspective. So Galton suggests Okay, if we remove direct violence from the society, we achieve negative peace. And if we remove direct structural cultural violence, and then we achieve positive peace. So according to Gautam, peace is not just one, but there are different types of peace, negative and positive peace. And if we want to achieve positive peace, we need to work on removing structural cultural violence as well as direct violence. This uh, economic condition often causes unequal access to resources because if you don't have enough economic power, you cannot provide, provide the same amount of things to everybody, right? You have to compete limited resource to access. So unequal access to resources is closely linked with economic condition development of the country. And because of these limited resources, people fight against each other, right? To access more political economic opportunity, right? Deep rooted causes is often linked with those access issue because of the limited resources. So that is why structural violence is also linked to the development of the country. And culture is also always used because someone has to be removed in order to get resources. And then they use religious difference, ethnic differences to access resources. So certain groups are not allowed to stand for election, meaning the person have the group have no access to political power, right? And losing political power means losing economic access. You know, no school in the region, 
no healthcare center in the region, for instance. So development human rights issues are closely linked with structural and cultural violence. I want to give an, uh, an actual example to differentiate between this direct structural and cultural violence. Let's give an example of Aceh. Direct violence will be you know, the, the violence done at the surface level between the Indonesian military you know, and the Free Aceh movement. So when they fight, you know, it's direct violence between the two actors. You know, when they do the DOM and when they do the uh, DOM is direct operasi militer. And then when they do any military exercise in, in Aceh, that is direct violence. Structural violence will be how that Aceh conflict has been, you know, constructed, you know, basically, you know, because the Achenes, you know, would see themselves as, as an oppressed people because they would say that, you know, they would not have the freedom, you know, politic, uh, to, to politically exercise their political power, you know, everything is decided by Jakarta and then uh, the, the economic interest of Aceh, you know, has for a long time be take, been taken away also by the central government uh, to the point that Aceh, you know, have become, you know, one of the poorest in Indonesia, you know, so that is what, you know, caused actually the direct violence. And that is the structural violence that have created, you know, the conflict between the Achenese and the Indonesian government. And cultural violence would be, you know, the uh, the attitude and the perception of people on both sides. You know, meaning that they uh, like legitimize the use of violence against the other actors. You know, because this is seen as a mean of protecting their interests. So if if they if the Indonesian military suppress, you know, the 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 free Aceh movement, the GAM and the Achenese people, they legitimize this by saying that this is something that they should do. You know, uh, you know, to 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 pursue, you know, the interests of the Indonesian. Uh, you know, government or the, the central government. And when the the Free Aceh movement, when they fight against the Indonesian military and they use violence, they also justify this, you know, by saying that this is a means of protecting themselves. You know, so you have that three levels of, of, of violence, the direct ones and then the structural ones that created the whole uh, situation and mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the acts, you know, the, that, that legitimize, you know, the, the violent action based on the attitudes and the perception of both parties. And just to note that, you know, the longer you are involved in a conflict situation, you know, the, the worse your attitude and the worse your perception will become. Okay. Because there will be stories, you know, about how the other sides have perpetrated violence against us and it will create, you know, a, a very negative emotions on the part of those victims, you know, and then when the stories go around, it will create and expand the stories even more. And then they will create a, a situation where more violence will be, you know, justified. And then that will just create the escalation and the expansion of the conflict. So that's how, you know, the three uh, concepts are connected together. Yeah, as we hear, the longer the conflict is, the complex the perceptions and uh, attitude will be. It's actually reproduced in history for many times, renewed and reinvented. And also one more thing, if we look at the, situation in Myanmar, I also see cultural violence has been renewed for many times in history since colonial time, because colonial period, they started using cultural violence, you know, particular groups are used for particular administrative purpose and excluded in the process. So that has been maintained and renewed for several times in history, and it become more complex in the current constitution. So that's how um, cultural structural violence has been used in history. And that is reflected into the direct violence in the ongoing conflict. So we see how difficult to deal with structural cultural violence and subjective aspect as the conflict is prolonged. I would like to talk a bit about peace. That is most complex and uh, tricky issue. 
um, this is famous thing. They make a desert, you know, empty land and call it peace. Peace can be achieved very easily if you remove everybody and stay alone in yourself. And then you have no conflict, right? Because there's no person. Oh, that's nice. But after three months, you recognize you are no longer peaceful in yourself because you are alone. Nobody is around you, right? So this is maybe not the right way to achieve peace. So I have a question to you. What do you mean by peace? Is it a peace without harming or killing each other? Or is it a peace in such a way that the individual community and the countries have the opportunity for mutual development and self improvement economic, political, cultural, and emotional, as well as spiritual? Which peace would you like to achieve? Perhaps many people want to achieve this B, because A is a negative peace. And B is a positive piece, as we discussed. In academia, then how do we deal with that? Okay. First, Pax, we use sometimes the term Pax. Pax means the absence of war and violence. So it's a negative piece. And the third one, Shalom, is a piece at all level, including spiritual rebel. So you have to achieve inner peace as well. Sometimes you may need mediation. Sometimes you need the theology to study you know, religion, right? To achieve inner peace as well. So these are two extreme, Pax and Shalom. But there is a between tranquility of audience, the tranquility of good order. This is what we call peace with justice. Why peace with justice? Because to reach Shalom, you have to work on yourself, in yourself. But in most academic research, what people try to achieve is the tranquility of good order, peace with justice. Because it's partly because dealing with interpersonal relations and society, community, where many people gather. In that context, how do we achieve peace is a big issue. That's a social science objective. So people talk about peace with justice, meaning there must be a certain rules within the community, within the state, or even international community. So there's certain legal foundation. And based on the law, if someone violated, the person may be punished, right? So, Peace with justice is the order, good order among the people, community, society, the state. So most academic research probably deal with the tranquility of good order. Shalom is necessary, but you have to work in yourself, right? So in a realistic term, maybe we in academia Try to achieve peace with justice is our goal in many cases. If we look at the academic studies on conflict, you find conflicts as a relational, international relation theory, political science, legal sociology, and conflict as one's inner situation. You have to go to psychology, theology area. So that's how different academic disciplines try to achieve peace, but from different angles at this different levels. And peace and conflict study include psychology and theology as part of research. Why? Because we know inner peace is also important. If decision makers have made sort of psychological problem, perhaps it's difficult to achieve peace within a country or between the country. And some people talk about uh, Vladimir Putin's psychological situation just because they doubt if he, is, he has inner peace or not. So these are also important areas of research in peace and conflict studies. We can define peace broad and narrow. 
always and uh, especially when war is ongoing people more talk about how to stop fighting right but behind the scene we start talking about how to reconstruct the country what are the administrative arrangement power relation in a sense to achieve positive peace is extremely difficult a country like japan has not achieved positive peace it achieved perhaps negative peace but not positive peace Okay, I think what what is meant by academic studies on conflict is is actually, you know, the the we have various field of studies, right? And then uh, all of us, you know, depending on the background that we have, we look at conflict through our own lenses, you know. Uh, so so for example, somebody from the school of communications, for example, we look at conflict as a breakdown in communications between you know, two uh, groups or two individuals. And then and then how to resolve this is to simply, you know, improve on communications because conflict happens because of communication breakdowns, misunderstanding and all those things. Somebody from the School of Psychology, for example, you know, uh, would look at the inner self, meaning that, you know, you have to look at your own, you know, uh, your attitude, your own way of looking at things. And sometimes, you know, people come comes with preconceived ideas, you know, that they have. And then this can create conflict, you know. So, so whatever happens within, you know, can then be translated outside to become something that will result in a conflict between that person and another person or that group and another group you know so from that psychological perspective you have to look that's why you have to look at the inner you know inner uh you know perceptions and attitudes and all those things somebody from the you know behavior and and that basically is the psychological approach at looking at conflict situations as opposed to behavioral approach behavioral approach would look at how people behave how people do things how they react you know to certain events and in different contexts and then to deal with conflict is to correct that negative behavior you know so negative behavior and then uh, some, some, you know, the international relations uh, uh, focus would actually look at how countries react to each other at the international level. You know how how they deal with each other. The 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 you know the the, the competition for power. How the international structure uh, is is uh, system is constructed, and all those things you know can result in conflict situations between the different you know the different. Uh, uh, nations or group of nations so that's how i are actually you know would look at it you know many of us in peace studies actually look at conflict as something that is constructed you know conflict can be constructed and because conflict can be constructed conflict can also be deconstructed meaning that you look at the details you know, you look at those variables, you know, that can cause a conflict situation and try to address, you know, those details, those variables. So if conflict is constructed, it can also be deconstructed. And from this particular perspective, you know, you look at the whole thing. You look at the communications, you look at the behavior, you look at the systems, you look at all those things in order to find, you know, where is it, you know, that things have gone gone wrong and how do we correct you know these things so that's where mapping and analysis is important you know from this particular perspective so what we are trying to say here is that academic studies on conflict would differ you know would, would depend on your school of thought and how you see things and how you see things you know will then will then guide you into into you know not only how you look at conflict but how you look at peace and how to construct peace from a conflict uh, hmm. situation. The conflict has been constructed. There is a cause to that conflict, you know, in Papua. And, and, and I think you also identified, you know, the reasons why that conflict is still ongoing and has still not been resolved. You know, you mentioned the lack of political will, you know, of the leaders on both sides. And then <clears throat> also that there are so many interests, you know, there are so many interests 
uh, that that you know that that supersedes you know the interest for peace you know uh, economic interest political uh, that is your answer then you know that is the answer why the conflict is is protracted why the, why the conflict is still ongoing you know because there is no sincere efforts to look at the root of the conflict what caused the conflict in the first place and to address that root of conflict even if there are attempts at resolving the conflict but those attempts will not be successful because they have not targeted the roots of the conflict. I'll give you another example. In Southern Thailand, you know, we have had a peace process in Southern Thailand uh, since 2013. The conflict in Southern Thailand has been ongoing since 1786, you know, from the collapse of the Patani Sultanate in 1786. And then it's gone up and down and all those things. But a peace process in Southern Thailand only happened in 2013 and facilitated by Malaysia. And up to now, we still have war and conflict and violence in Southern Thailand, even with the peace process. Why? Simply because to me, this is my opinion, to me, they have not tried to attempt uh, to, to address the root cause of the problems and they are not on the same page. You know, they're on the same page. If you look at the perspective from the Thai government, what they want is to reduce violence. So their perspective is that, you know, for peace to, to you know, to happen, uh, we need to reduce the violence. We need to uh, give development to the area. They think that the area is a poor area. They want to raise the uh, standard of living. They pour money into the area. They, 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 they try to develop the area economically. And, and, you know, and then they are still surprised, you know, why we still do not have peace. Simply because on the other side, the Patani liberation movements, if you talk to the various groups that are there, what they want to do is to address historical injustice that have been there since the very beginning of the uh, conflict. So that was the root of the conflict, historical injustices. And they feel that even if the Thai government try you know, to address the situation by you know, pouring money and uh, doing development, that is not correcting historical injustice, which needs to be fine with a political solution. So they are not talking at the same level. You know, they are not talking at the same level. So that is why, you know, when we look at a particular conflict, we need to, 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 to be able to look at the proper perspective so that we can get to the roots of the problem. Because otherwise, no matter what peace process you have and all those efforts that you make, you will not be able to get peace in, in, you know, in, in a, a particular conflict situation. Which is also why for us academics, for us scholars, when we study conflict, we also need to determine which angle are we looking at. So somebody from a developmental perspective, you know, we have a lot of development studies experts, you know, they say, well, to resolve a conflict, you need to develop the area. You know, you need to, to, to you know, to, to make a um, uh, better life for the victims. We need to raise the economic standard. So they would do, you know, those kind of things. But then that will not solve the problem if that is not actually the root cause of the problem. Uh, so that's why it's, it's, it's important for us as academics and scholars also to make sure, you know, how, you know, we look at a particular uh, conflict and from which angle, you know, from which angle. So, so, uh, so that's why we are presenting to you this academic studies on conflict to show that there are various perspectives and angles you know, when scholars look at a particular conflict, uh, just to show you that, just but but not really to say that, you know, this is something applicable in all situations, you know, because different contexts would need different kind of solutions. The reason why in peace and conflict study, legal study is not as dominant as human rights study is that, well, human, study, human rights study has international convention, legal framework, whereas, in peace and the conflict study, there's no legal framework for peace <laughs> internationally, right? Um, we have some uh, international agreement to restrict certain behavior in war, but not for peace itself. So political science, international relations, sociologies are pretty common. And I also agree that um, if we look at the current situation in Burma, Myanmar, 
I see in each era in history, this conflict has been constructed by different political leaders, military junta, and also colonial masters. And this has been renewed for many times that made the situation more complex and ethnic, religious, linguistic relations are much more, more complex than, than history. But what is common in all these different academic discipline is I think we involve in um, applied science. Peace and conflict study is applied science. Applied science means it's not about the study by books and on in front of desk, but we apply it into, into practice. That's why uh, I, I consider peace and conflict study as an applied science. We, we are not just studying it for our knowledge or for our own sake, but we study it to actually apply it in reality and to practice it by using you know, those knowledge into reality to resolve conflict, to minimize violence, to solve problems. So it's important for us to continuously work on and accumulate more knowledge from non-Western perspective, because cases in Asia have many different new perspective, new foundational knowledge. So I think your contribution is more important in, in future peace and conflict studies. So this is a huge task for us now to achieve peace in the region because almost all country has a problem, uh, including my country. 30,000 people commit suicide every year. It's a, it's a more people dying than some of the conflict in your country, right? 30,000 people die, committed suicide. So it's nearly medium-sized conflict country. One question is about conflict, you know, and then is, is conflict all that bad? Can there be times when conflict is not only acceptable, but even useful? But think about it, you know, when can there be a times when conflict can be considered uh, useful and necessary? And then the second question is in regards to peace, because all of us want peace, uh, positive peace. Okay. Uh, just in, and because we are also looking at human rights, so so uh, just to think more about that concept of peace and justice, okay? Because people would say that they can not be peace without justice. You know, what what do you think of this? You know, what do you think of this? So so just those two questions uh, for you to think about. So just just think about that. You know, one is about conflict itself. And then the other one is about you know, peace and, and justice. So, so think about that.